So thank you everyone who joined us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Raoud Stoller and I'm the program director at uh, Jeff and Israel. Uh, we are all going through challenging and unique days, learning what is happening locally and globally and the influence uh, it has on our lives. And in addition, as members of the philanthropic community, we are learning the needs of the most vulnerable and weak populations these days, most dramatically affected by the coronavirus and the reality that it is created. Our team, as you know, is in touch with the nonprofit sector, with the government of Israel and with the funders community. And what we found is that there is a real need for accurate and up-to-date information about the needs in the field, as well as a place for a safe discussion about the potential role of philanthropy in this social field. And therefore, in the past weeks, we have started to gather information for funders briefing back, uh, backed by the uh, series of webinars such as this webinar and to bring the information from the people on the ground and able discussion um, for the role of philanthropy. Um, today, we dedicated the next hour to the issue of children and youth at risk in light of COVID-19 crisis in Israel. And we will hear uh, from our four speakers a 360 overview from various angles. Vered Windman, uh, Executive Director, the Israel National Council for the Child, and the Civic Society representative on the Intersectoral Roundtable Subcommittee. Vered will, rep will present the overview of the challenges, the issues, and the needs in dealing with the corona crisis. After her, we will hear um, Iris Florentin, Senior Vice President, Head of Social Services at the Ministry of Social Affairs. She will present the Government of Israel angle on this topic. And for the philanthropic uh, perspective, we will hear Leora Proper, Jeff Fan member, Social Investor and Chair of Proper Family Foundation, and Renana Levin Pashkus from the Schusterman Foundation. So thank you, the four of you, for taking the time, uh, preparing for this conversation and joining us. Before we will start, um, four technical things. As you have all uh, noticed, you're all muted to prevent any background noises when our speakers are uh, presenting. In the last part, we will have time for Q&A. So this is how it will work. On the bottom of your screen, go to participants, if you can see. There, you can click raise your hand. So once we will get uh, to the discussion part, I will say your name and unmute you so you will be able to make your comment and ask your question. Um, so within all of this, I will um, give the microphone to Vered. Vered, if you can please unmute yourself and Hello everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us today to learn about the effects of COVID-19 on children and youth in Israel. Can you hear me well, Naut? I can hear you well. There's a bit of uh, noise in the back, but uh, we'll try I'll, to... I'll do my best to speak loudly so and clearly. So I'd like to thank JFN for facilitating this meeting and Reut for assisting me in preparation for this presentation. And over the next minute, I plan to review what COVID-19 means to children in Israel, what challenges it brings, and what solutions should be considered. So this overview is the culmination of the last four weeks and relies on information mostly received by the Intersectorial Subcommittee from multiple fronts. So Ruth, will you be kind to, enough to help me with the presentation? Yeah, I think everyone can see uh, the presentation right now, right? On the screen. Thank you. So the challenge, heightened risk, less assistance services, and compromised ability to identify children and youth at risk. The risk for children presents itself in two dimensions. First, an increase in the number and intensification of violence against children. Second, a decrease in assistance options. The causes for these dimensions of risk are as follows. One, heightened levels of stress and anxiety among children. 
two, heightened levels of stress and anxiety among adults, mostly parents and family members. This leads to an increase in risk of violence, physical violence, sexual and mental, increased exposure to domestic violence and the adverse effects of being exposed to violence within the family unit. Three, significant impediments in identifying at-risk children due to the lockdown and the decrease in operations of the following national systems, education system, health, welfare, and judicial. And four, a significant decrease in assistance and protection measures to children and youth due to the lockdown. And five, a decrease in community-based assistance services such as community centers, family health centers, and more. COVID-19 has uncovered major challenges, some systemic and some arising from the specific situation. To simplify this intricate web of issues and responses, I've divided the landscape to three spheres, family unit, community, and infrastructure, which means state level. First, I will review each sphere's specific challenges and follow with what has been accomplished so far and what remains to be done. In the family unit sphere, prolonged stay at home, emotional and mental stress and worries about money, all of these may contribute to worsening domestic violence violence against children and child neglect. An increasing number of children are exposed to physical, sexual, and mental violence, severe neglect, and domestic violence, which affects the child even if he or she are not the direct victim of violence but are exposed to it. Two, limited access to food and commodities due to the movement restrictions, no money due to furlough, or employment germination and shutdown of schools and other residential care facilities for children and youth that provided meals and accommodation. Three, a lack of computers, internet connection, and some time necessary parental assistance, which hinders access to remote learning and deepens socioeconomic gaps. And four, the above mentioned may lead under certain circumstances to risky behavior among youth such as alcohol and substance abuse and runaways. In the community sphere, there are less community services, social workers, psychologists, and other central support staff have been furloughed and most assistance services closed. Two, clear narrowing down of opportunities to identify at-risk children and youth as a result of shutting down the education system and community health services, which are responsible for most of the reporting. And in the national infrastructure sphere, ineffective communication, failure to establish open real-time communication channels between the government, local authorities, and the field such as CSOs and professionals. And two, difficulties in coordinating national efforts to provide basic needs such as food, computers, internet access, or eligibility for assistance by the state. Three, there is no proper solution for, out, or not enough at least, proper solution for out-of-home care facilities or juvenile correctional facilities in case of need for quarantine. And four, a visible increase in reports of youth on the street, shutdown of shelters, and lack of information among law enforcement or proper approach and protocols in such cases. Five, education system shutdown and social distancing prevent identifying a risk situation. The following steps have been taken so far. Following intense efforts, welfare workers and services are gradually reinstated nationwide. Numerous voluntary efforts by civic society, citizen initiated, private sectors and philanthropy, and on different levels, 
to provide necessities such as commodities and equipment for families in need, especially before Pesach. And three, the NCC National Council for the Child Assistance Center both its volunteers and digital presence to provide better online assistance. So what needs to be done now? One is putting together a centralized communication mechanism which tracks, regulates, and directs all efforts by multi-stakeholders. For instance, updates on regulations that do not reach the field in real time. Two, ensuring continued and universal access to food, remote learning equipment, internet access, and family support programs. And three, closing human capital gap in the field of at risk children, namely counseling, training, consulting, and support. In this, I mean returning relevant professionals to work immediately. And what needs to be done in the near future? The crisis lays bare existing systemic fail points in the realm of at risk children and youth. It also presents an opportunity to fix those fail points by building infrastructure, knowledge, development, and policy design. This is a strategic opportunity to minimize socioeconomic gaps. The following are recommendations, the following are recommendations based on what we've learned. One is convening a national intersectorial forum a permanent one, dedicated to at-risk children and youth. Two is compiling a comprehensive statement paper by CSOs based on their experience. And three is establishing a financial resilience mechanism for CSOs working in the realm of children. Also knowledge development and professionalism in identifying at-risk children remotely via digital means, and by this I mean developing professionals ethical guidelines. And five, development of remote therapeutic solutions, access to infrastructure and professional training. And six and last is establishing a one-stop shop to provide basic needs and referral to appropriate address for children and families by synergizing government, local authority, and community resources. That's for my part, in short. So thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any question you may have at the end of the, the next session. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Vered. Um, so within that, uh, I will uh, um, invite Iris Florentin, please. Good evening, I'm with you this evening. Happy to be, to be here. I would uh, try and tell a little bit about the government decisions and state of mind and the way the government puts services and the way the services are uh, mended in for the coronavirus time. First of all, I would like to start and say that the government is in charge of policy and uh, preparing different kinds of services for the local municipalities. The policy, the way of thinking is coming from the government as we talk, and all the services all over Israel in the local municipalities and in the NGOs are done the same way. We give the name of the service, the way of working, the policy, the, the budget, and the services are going on and working. And that's why we can see all the services covering all Israel together. I would like to say that the budget for those services are about 2 billion shekels for a year, for 350,000 children at risk every year, out of 1 million point three families that get services in the Ministry of Social Affairs. I would like to say that we have different kinds of models in Israel. One of the last models that we work on are the past three, four years are models that look at the children in their family, which means that we have to give the service for the child and the family in the same time, even though the child has to leave the family and be an outpatient if it's at need, and I will talk about it in a minute. But what we want to say is that we, we, we would like to give all the, the help 
and the rehabilitation to the parents so they can treat the children in the family and have the family for as a whole. But if the child cannot stay in the family, we will take the family out, the child out of the family to an outpatient like a pnimia, omna, or different kinds of services that we have in Israel. I would like to, to say about those services that we put a whole bunch of budget on a family, which means that we give a social worker to that family, which have a, uh, that social worker have 12 families and they give therapy and they have a planner next to him that help the social worker, help the family do what they need in the tree treat. And we have about 40,000 shekels a year to give the family for treatment so the children can stay back home and will not be taken out to outpatients. Different other services we have in Israel because we have to have different kinds of services for different kinds of families and children are services from the age of birth till the age of 18 for children that have families in the background and for children that don't have families in the background, which means that we have to look at children that are at risk in the age of uh, birth to three. And we have services for children that have to stay after school and cannot come home or they have to stay after school until the evening so they can be a little bit at home because the parents still can treat them from the evening till the morning. We have different kinds of treatment stations for the families, for the children, for children at risk, for families that are all over Israel. We have treatments for children sexually abused and are beaten back home. We have services that can check and do an intake and find what's the problem, then send them to treatment. All those services are across Israel and have to give the right services. I would like to say two or three words about the primio, the outpatient and the foster families, which are quite a big number in Israel. We have children in outpatient, a great, we have 7,000 children in those places. I would like to tell you that in the area of the COVID, it's, it's quite difficult and, and different to treat those children in the outpatient situation, which means that the first five weeks, we didn't send the children back home because sending children back home, especially in areas of quarantine, means that they can come back with the virus back to the, to the outpatient. And it's quite uh, difficult. After five weeks, we understood that we have to send children back home because they want to see their parents and it's their right to see the parents and the parents want to see them. I want to t say two things about the work in the outpatient. The first thing is, think what it is to stay with children five weeks, which they cannot leave the, 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 the area. At the beginning, we had police coming in when the children were playing basketball and giving a, a, a report to the manager, why are children playing outside, which was very hilarious. And we stopped that. But just thinking about the social workers, the madrichim and the people working in the primio, the outpatient, they have to treat children which are not leaving, they're not going to school, and they have to give a lot of different kinds of work and uh, things to do with them. And on the ways of thinking of children going home, we sent children back home for two weeks in, uh, in Passover. And I wanna say something about the ability of parents to hold the children back home. We thought we're sending children for two weeks and we, saw, we sent children with food and with the tablets also. And we, there was this one boy, not only one boy, but one of the boys I can remember was going to Tveria and his pneumonia was in Bebak. And there was a quarantine there since that day. And his mother, once he came home, his mother said, I don't know what to do with you. After about eight hours, you go back to Bebak and he was sent back to Bebak and we had to open the quarantine and let them back, back in. So this is a little bit of, of the atmosphere of, in the Pimio and in the Omnat situation. What I want to say is we have a children that we have, we have a outpatient for children at risk, which we have to take them out immediately. We call them And these days they are full of children we're taking out. So the children, any time of day, if the child is beaten or sexually abused, is taken out to those, those places. And I would like to tell you that to ask the, the, the managers to, to stay open and get children coming in with the COVID virus, and they have to come in and be in, in a, a quarantine for two weeks, and just think together with me what it means to be for, with a child two weeks in a quarantine with a person in the 
outpatient. It's quite, quite a deal of things we have to do so the places will stay open. And I want to say more that some of the children that are taken out of the homes even nowadays are taken out by law. And we have to see how those social workers in the local municipalities, which do the work, have to, even though they have to do other things with the COVID virus now, they have to go on and take the children out of home and bring them out. We, of course, what I mean is we have to do everything so, so the children will have, have their rights, physical rights and other rights, emotional rights, and so on in these days, also in the COVID uh, era. What I want to say more is when a social setting, a social services are working, it's always with combination with the Ministry of uh, Education, with the police forces, with the, with the Ministry of Health, because everything is done together and each person or profession do it their side. And nowadays, when all the local situ settings are closed, we cannot do that. The ways of com communication and passing um, data or information about the child and the parents are blocked. All the, the channels are blocked, so we, can, we have to do it in a different way of doing it. And the first problem is the channels are, are blocked. The second problem is the children are back home. And if I want to tell you a small story about Chava, a young girl of eight years old, which was beaten by her mother and her father, and her father was outside in prison, and now he was sent back because the prisons are sending people back. Or if I want to talk about Efrat, another child, which was sexually abused by uh, her neighbor, and her mother is a, a, with, a, a, with a, a health problem, which is not treated now, and they're all back home and they have to mingle in the, the house and do something. And it's an era where the social workers are, were not back at work until the last week. And it's very hard to see what's going on the, and the, the courts are working a lot less. So we have to do different things a lot differently. So I want to say two main things about doing things differently and then putting a little bit of detail in a couple of ideas which I think we can do nowadays. The first thing is being there and finding the children before something is happening, which we call in Hebrew, itur. Being there before there is very, uh, the, w before the danger. Being there and finding the child one step before, one day before the problem is acute. The other way of thinking is being there right on the time when there is crisis and helping in the right moment. To do that, we need, I think a lot of different things. First of all, I have a committee in the Ministry of Social Affairs, which started working these days to think about those two issues that I, I'm, or states of mind I was talking about. I think we have to use a lot of digital work and I wanted to give you a, a little bit of ideas which we started doing and can be done in the digital area. The first thing is we wanna pass a WhatsApps a, by the Kupat Cholim, the health sector, these days, the health sectors send SMSs to people that they can get treatment. So we want to put all in those SMSs different kinds of things to the parents. The other way is maybe thinking of putting different kinds of things through the internet by a Moked 105. Another way is opening a national place for finding the children and being there to find the children and be there to enter the, the the children. Another option is Four Girls. It's another NGO, which I know, which have an internet. I'm just, just an idea. Uh, they have different kinds of professionals there, and the professionals know to answer and then give the right uh, information and send the children to treatment. Now they have a binam lachutit, I don't know how to say it, that they can find children at risk and send us the children. Another thing we're doing now is a special application with uh, Intec inside that uh, women, children can put their information inside and we can find them at risk and different kinds of ideas that I have here and we can go on talking about them in the digital area, which I think is the main area now because that's where our children are. The last thing I want to talk about is about the therapists and the people that work with the children one of the things we have to put in a lot of thinking and working with is working with the people that do all the work nowadays, which means the social workers, 
the leaders of all the places that the, the outpatient go. Now, all the services that are given, we have to help the workers go on and see what they see and go on work because people work very hard and they need us to help them also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Iris, for taking the time and sharing this. Um, so now we will, uh, uh, moving forward for the philanthropic perspective, and I would like to uh, invite the Aura proper to speak, but first I will share my screen with her presentation. So while you do that, I'll just say a few words about myself. I'm a chair of my family's foundation, and we focus on social mobility of children and youth at risk via education mostly. And uh, among other things, I'm board member at Tovanot Bachinuch, Yeladim Besikui and Apple Seeds. So you can understand the perspective I come from. So I just want to say a few words on, on, on the way we acted during the last few weeks and uh, we'll keep on acting because we're now uh, shifting from emergency to emergency routine. Uh, we, we decided to stay focused on what we do best, which is supporting our organization and addressing the changing needs of their audiences. And I want to put emphasis on the word changing because our approach is understanding what's happening on the ground, pushing and supporting ongoing surveys. So that means mapping needs and available solutions. And I must say that the, the, you, the, you find that the organizations want to act upon their gut feelings. And I think that as funders, it's important that we insist on uh, quick surveys because I think there's a big information gap and that might be also a bridge to the government and I'll talk about it later. Uh, and the other thing would be uh, adjusting the services of the organizations to the changing needs. So if I can take an example of uh, what we did, let's say it uh, to Vanot, so it meant that we first was the need for uh, food, of course, and we found ourselves providing for the uh, students and their families. And now we have another survey out that suggests that, of course, the emotion and needs are now very great and the uh, teachers are finding themselves in need for support to support their children in the uh, students in the emotional dialogue. So uh, that's one example. Another one would be what Iris talked about, the fact that the, in the Pneumiot, people are actually, they were in a lockdown so in Yeladim Besikui, we understood that the most uh, important need is the, the need for toys. So uh, together with the JDC, we actually uh, provided uh, vouchers for Toys R Us, uh, and, and meaning that the, each uh, manager could buy the toys relevant for his audience. And I must say a good word, what Iri said about the, the managers of these Pneumiot, because they're really, really, um, working very hard uh, for the children. And I think that, uh, that uh, the most important uh, thing about grants is giving bigger, faster, and more flexible. Uh, meaning that, of course, you can deepen and broaden the, the giving and give uh, above and beyond. But I think the key is being flexible about it. Okay, so meaning that if you decided to promote a program but uh, is now not relevant, then of course you can give to other things. And what I want to elaborate on is collaborating with other funders because uh, at, at first we did that with the natural partners and the toy example that I gave you before is, 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 is uh, relevant to that. And uh, I found out that surprisingly there is a lot of willingness to collaborate, okay? Because things are so uh, immediate, you find that the barriers to collaboration, even within the organizations, have fallen. That means that us as funders, I think that is a great opportunity for us to uh, uh, collaborate between ourselves and make our organizations, the ones that we invest in, collaborate as well. So uh, just a few things about collaboration maybe. So I think that, that uh, it will be with other funders and other stakeholders, okay? Iris is sitting here, but it could be other people from other uh, ministries, Verdi is sitting here, so uh, she's um, uh, really sitting with the um, committee 
of uh, children and uh, youth at risk. I think that we need one map of needs to be shared with the government, because I think that the, at the end of the day, uh, what's happening on the ground, it's a big blind spot for uh, um, the ministries. And I think that we need that uh, to be uh, shared with all of us. I think that we need to coordinate uh, intervention. If, uh, if you talk about, let's say, computers are in, in the community uh, covered by a uh, few funders and, and I, hopefully the government, then others can address digital skills or the FIMIOT. And I think that the most important thing for us is clear one voice to create get a greater uh, impact on the government's actions. And, uh, and that's important because I think that now uh, many things, many programs and that should be renewed are actually now up to uh, um, like a debate. Will they be, will they not be? And I think that here we need a clear voice of the uh, funders. And I, 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 as I said, I think the crisis is an opportunity to collaborate. So one word about what uh, we can do now for later. So uh, I think that we need to think about what we take with us and what we leave behind. So uh, that's collecting the learnings. And that's very important because this would be leveraging the crisis. And I know that Renana will talk about it later. So I won't elaborate it, but I think this is the role of philanthropy as accelerator of new ideas. And we should not uh, presume that because now we're in a crisis that anybody else would take that role. This is still our role and it's very important because let's say in uh, apple seeds, we look about what we can do from working as a startup. Suddenly from being fifth, 150 uh, employers where we cut back by 70% and working faster and quicker. The e-learning task committee we have in Tovanot, so many things that we can do now to do that and share these insights with the ecosystem, with all the stakeholders, and again, including the government, okay? So if, uh, let's say, in Tovanot uh, Bachinuch, we issued a very big survey with Professor Ben Benishti on uh, teachers, students, and, and parents, I think that this would be relevant to all the, the, the education ministry, the welfare ministry, to understand the, the needs and where support is, is, is needed and the, the, the different views on that. And uh, of course, joining larger conversation uh, circles to support policy change in the future. I can give an example of Corona Studio that, that I was part of this morning that's breaking the paradigms in education. So what uh, learning from what's happening now, good things are happening as well. So how do we take this? Or the digital, the digital uh, uh, action committee of the private Could you join? So if I can end by recommendation. So I would like to, to call you all to join uh, Vered at the round table. And as she said, making sure it, it would transform into a permanent forum, okay? For me, I think that uh, I wasn't aware of, 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 of the ability to do such uh, a great work collaborating all together. And I think that this is, is, is uh, we should insist that it becomes uh, such a permanent forum. And I want to invite you all to continue this conversation between funders. And I think that will en enable us to uh, have collaboration on specific uh, issues. We have different audiences, if it's early childhood, ch children, youth, or we have like uh, the, as we said, the, the, the children at risk in the community, we have them out of the community. And I think that this will enable smaller circles of dialogue between us in order to make sure we uh, coordinate and even do things uh, together. So I wanna thank Jeff for, for, for the opportunity to talk about these things. And hopefully uh, I will be talking to you um, in the next conversation we set up. Thanks. For sure, not hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Leora. Um, we will have the opportunity to continue uh, your comments um, um, after um, Renana will share uh, Schusterman perspective. So, Renana. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going to share a little bit about what uh, Schusterman Foundation did in Israel in this field. Um, so it's interesting because Corona kind of caught us 
at the beginning of a uh, strategic process in the field, we're looking to increase our investments in the fields of child abuse and neglect. We're looking to create bigger impact, maybe uh, broaden the uh, different areas that we're invested in. Rav Dadia Molad joined our team and she's leading this um, strategy process. So we kind of like started a strategy, strategy and then Corona came. So Corona is for us, we're looking at it as some kind of window of opportunity. How can we use what happened during Corona to kind of like push our strategic process like 10 steps further than it would have been and maybe even more. So Corona actually kind of created a disruption in the world and obviously also a, disrupt a disruption in the field of child abuse and neglect. And the questions that we're trying to ask ourselves in the fields that we uh, care about strategically, and obviously this is one of them, is how can this disruption create an intervention for us as funders that will take this field uh, further? As Leora said, we wanna take what we can take and leave what we can behind. Obviously social segregation and things like that we'd rather leave behind. But there are things that are happening at Corona now that are gonna be good for us in the future. We wanna kind of see what those are. So we're looking at different types of interventions that we can take. Um, take a step back a second. At the beginning, for the first two, three weeks, we at Schusterman did basic emergency grants to the organizations that we fund on a regular basis, and also to populations that we might not fund on a regular basis, like um, refugees. But we, um, we understood that they're a population in need right now due to corona, and we tried to kind of help with basic needs of food packages, medicine, things that are here and then now. Once we like stepped out of the emergency, look at things and try to look at how we operate, we're trying to look at this more strategically. So we try to see these interventions and things that we can do. So maybe like if we talked about what Vera said, there's obviously gonna be an increase in violence. We know that that's coming. We know that once we all step out of our homes, we're expecting a lot more children to need these safe homes. So a, a possibility is increasing a grant to an organization that we fund that we know is gonna have increased activity post-corona or even what we call midterm, because once we let it out a little bit, we'll be able to see more kids that are coming out. Different pilots of treatment plans that we can try now that we have to, we have to change everything, so let's try new pilots. Technological tools that can be leveraged. We, the world has moved into technology. Child abuse and neglect wasn't the most technological tool, but now everyone's using technology. So how can we leverage that to better our research? There's definitely research that can be done about the field and about these children that we can learn from. How does, how does emergency situations affect these fields? How do we react? Best reactions, best practices. And the last thing is, it's obvious that we've all taken a hit. The, um, they're talking about lowering foundation money, um, not talking about Schuster, I'm talking about in general. Um, and all organizations are taking, are trying to figure out how to work in the here and the now, and what are they looking at in 2020, what are they looking at in 2021. This need can definitely create more interactions between the organizations, more collaborations, um, more shared resources. So that's something that we can try to help um, push forward to increase, um, to better the field. Um, can you take it one forward? So, um, so these are just, these are what we use to consider a type of evaluation. If we have, uh, if we have some kind of like intervention that we're thinking about, this is what we use. These are the, some of the evaluation. None of them are must-haves. None of them are um, gonna be a clear go, no-go, but these are some of the things that we talk about when we're looking at it. I'm obviously sharing just our thoughts and um, I hope it's helpful. So like, what's the timeline? timeline. Can we get it up on the ground between two to three months? Corona's here now. If we can't get it up, if we're talking about May 2021, then there's nothing to talk about right now. Let's do that on the regular pace. Um, is the project thought out enough? Does it have the, enough pillars? Does it have enough legs that we can move forward that we know that, yes, this is a good enough project? Um, who's the partner that we're talking about? Is the, we as funders can offer the funding, but we obviously need a partner in the field to take it and move forward. So is our partner strong enough to actually do it in this time that we need, do it in the budget that we're talking about, create proper research? Um, another thing that we're talking about is if on a regular basis we might give a small portion of the money, of the money and talk, tell the organization to go find other funders. That's not something that we can expect organizations to do right now. Um, so we can create um, a group of funders that work together, we can do a partnership with the government, we can think what we're doing, but if we're going on to a process that's gonna happen in the next two or three months, I think we need to think about, are the full amounts of funds ready for us to make sure that we're, we're up and running in two months? 
Um, another thing is partnerships with the Ministry of Welfare and other ministries. Uh, if we create a proof of concept now in the next few months that works, do we have a partner in the government who wants this? Is this something that we can do? It might be that we don't, and this is going to be philanthropic money ongoing, but that's something to consider. And the last thing that we have to look about is we know that rushing a project and moving it faster than its regular course is something that's going to cost us a price. And before going into it, we just have to know what the price is. We can pay the price and we could decide to pay the price, but we just have to understand what we're getting into and what price we're paying. Does it mean less research, less evaluation, uh, lower numbers? What are the prices that we're going to pay in order to get this project off the ground? Um, and just to close, I wanted to share some of our initial thoughts. Uh, we're currently looking for lots of um, ideas um, of what to do. And these are just some of what we have. These are very um, initial thoughts, so please don't share them further. But um, we'd love to create discussions about any and all of these. We're obviously in discussion with our obvious partners, um, with different funders that are in the field that we're in. And we, there's a lot of partners and funding partners that are in like similar fields that you can see that, um, so if there's a funder like Yadin Adiv who does um, early childhood in education and we're doing early childhood in prevention uh, of child abuse, then we can look about how we can do prevention through the education system. So there's different partnerships that we can talk about um, of funders that are not exactly in the core of uh, the fields that we're funding. So one of the things that we're talking about is a technological prevention tool. Um, there, we currently, as Ben had said, don't have a way to identify kids who are in distress. So we have to see how we can kind of like come into those homes that are, have those kids and see them and see that they're seen and then send someone to try to help as much as we can. So one thing we're talking about, this is together with uh, Haruv and um, with Kaima Labs of Ben Ariely, is try to leverage um, the um, the homeschooling system that the Ministry of Education is using in order to create, to put something in that you can identify that a child's in distress. Eye motions, different changes that they're doing. A way to identify, it doesn't mean that they are, but there's something to see that we, we it's one way to identify. Another thing is there's treatments that are happening now that are happening from afar. Some of those treatments are better to do face-to-face, -face, but some of those treatments are actually working out quite well. So what, as Lior said, is are things that we can take from corona. It's definitely more time-consuming, saves funds. What are those tools that we can then use now, uh, later on? Another thing is um, through the pediatricians, um, trying to see how we can do more prevention, more identification. We don't have the education system. We don't have those teachers who can see a child who's not coming in with a sandwich, who's not, who has some kind of bruises. What are those, who are the people that the children are meeting that we can use to then leverage it? This is something that it's, and obviously Corona increased, but it's something that it's important to do. Or, um, so here we're working with Goshen, who does this on, in lots of fields. And we're looking at how we can work with Goshen around prevention of child abuse and neglect. Another thing is what's called universal prevention. So um, a model where you throw, you look at a whole chatach of a, a population, um, like young mothers in Jerusalem, or first time moms in Jerusalem, and we're gonna go visit them and try to see how through one, two, three visits, we can um, either treat little, make little changes that will prevent some kind of abuse or neglect, or identify a problem that needs more, um, more treatment. Another thing is something called strong community. Strengthening the pillars in a specific community to use them to um, basically leverage the whole community um, a few steps up. So if we think about it, currently the only people who are seeing other people are our neighbors. Our neighbors are the ones that are hearing the screaming. Our neighbors are the ones that, are, that can see what's happening in other people's homes. Are our neighbors actually um, calling the right places when needed. Um, I hope no one's calling us on child services. There would definitely be room for concern sometimes. Um, and other things are like, there's technological tools right now to identify distress on social media platforms for teens. But we know that everyone's there now. So how do we do those with younger children? How do we take those tools and bring them lower the age? Um, and Lots of different models. And the last thing is like strengthening organizations such as the National Council for the Child. There's definitely gonna be an increased need for advocacy. This, the round tables, the surfacing of the needs, the, tr the, the, um, the uh, 
tools that were provided post one if there is and a lot of other organizations raised the need and then Elise and other government offices provided um, as she said now the social workers are back to work they understood needs that happened at the beginning when we sort of provided emergency so increasing organizations that can that can be the advocates uh, advocates for kids that can raise the children's needs that can bring it up so we know that the round table is talking about exactly what needs to be uh, discussed so we're looking at these we're looking at many more we'd love to hear um, thoughts that other funders are having around um, interventions that can happen around directions we are um, really looking for uh, looking for partnerships in this field and in other fields and would love to hear thoughts about it I think that's it for me unless I had stuff thank that I didn't mention. thank you Elena to summarize this, I think we can point some uh, noticeable aspects from the, from the three angles that we have heard. Uh, the first is the potential opportunity that this crisis creates for us in order to resolve this matter in the short, ter in the short term uh, and in the long run, as Benny says, such as the one-stop shop that Vered mentioned, recognizing the needs and allocating them to the right organization. Secondly, similar to other uh, social issues now more than ever, uh, the necessary role of developing dig digital solutions, identify at risk situation remotely, mental support, education, after school activities, and many more. And um, the, th the, the third aspect is the importance of cooperating, um, sharing knowledge among all stakeholders like we, we just had um, in this conversation with a mutual aim to create uh, sustainable solutions. Um, for that, um, we... Hold on. So, um, we invite you to reach out to us uh, in case you want to participate in a funder think tank on this issue in the next couple of days. Um, connect to other funders working in this field and share with us your foundation response or if you have any other um, questions. And uh, for those who ask, yeah, we did, we record this, this uh, conversation, we will upload this to our website. Uh, in the next few days, we will send this also with a briefing that we create with the uh, Institute uh, for Law and Philanthropy in Tel Aviv University, special brief for the um, uh, philanthropic community, um, and also with the notes that we have taken during these conversations. Um, thank you all for, for joining us uh, tonight. And there are more webinars on the way, so stay tuned and follow us on the uh, JFN website. We have this week on Thursday, Arab Society uh, briefing conversation, as well as a Green Funders Forum meeting. We will have a, a similar conversation about the Haredi Society, and we are very, uh, we are, you're very welcome to join us uh, to them as well. Thank you, Vered. Thank you, Iris, Liora, and Renana for all the preparation and the efforts uh, you put in before this conversation and during. Um, and we are looking forward to see you in the next meetings. So thank you all. Thank you, Ruth. And if you have, if I just had, you know, you have everyone has my emails. If you have any questions or comments, so just feel free after this call to to write me. So thank you, and good thank night. You. Good night. Thank you.